So far, we've talked a lot about output markets and input markets in the circular flow diagram, and we've mentioned financial markets only in passing. Now, financial markets are just places that bring together people who have money with people who need money. In the circular flow diagram, money flows into financial markets from households in the form of savings, and then firms draw on financial markets for the financial capital they need to make investments in output markets. But governments are active in financial markets as well. If a government runs a surplus, by which we mean that it raises more in tax revenues than it pays out in the form of transfers and purchases, then it is contributing to financial markets in what we call public savings. But if the government runs a deficit, if its tax revenues are less than the payments it makes in the form of transfers and purchases of goods, the government has to cover that deficit by borrowing money from financial markets. And the way that the government borrows money is by issuing bonds. Now, governments aren't the only places that can issue bonds. Firms and corporations can issue bonds, nonprofits can issue bonds, even individuals could issue bonds. But all bonds share the same basic features in common. So what is a bond? Well, you can think of a bond as simply a piece of paper that has three pieces of information written on it. The first piece of information we're going to call the face value of the bond. The second piece of information we're going to call the annual coupon of the bond. And the third piece of information we'll call the maturity date. So to make this more concrete, let's add some numbers. Suppose you have a bond with a face value of $1,000. Suppose the annual coupon is $100. And suppose that the maturity date is five years from now. That means that whoever is holding that bond will wait five years. And at the end of the five years, will receive the face value of that bond, will receive a payment of $1,000. And in the meantime, whoever is holding the bond will collect the annual coupon of $100 at the end of each year. So $100 after the first year, after the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and at the end of the fifth year when the face value is due. So this bond is simply a promise of future payments. And the question is, how much would you be willing to pay for such a bond? How much would you be willing to pay for the promise of these future payments? Well, there are several things you might worry about as you think about that question. The first thing you might worry about is how good is the promise from whoever is issuing the bond? Will whoever is issuing the bond still be around five years from now to make these payments? Or for that matter, two years from now to make that second coupon payment? So what you're worried about is what we call the default risk of the bond. What's the risk that whoever made the promise is going to default on that promise. A second thing you might worry about is what's going to be the inflation over that five-year period. If there's no inflation, then the thousand dollars you receive at the end will be able to buy exactly the same amount of goods and services as a thousand dollars would be able to buy today. But if there is inflation, then that thousand dollars won't be worth as much five years from now in terms of how much it can buy in terms of goods and services. So you're worried about risk that's due to inflation. So now let's think about a special kind of bond. It's called a TIPS, T-I-P-S, which stands for Treasury Inflation Protected Security. This is a special bond that the U.S. Treasury issues. It's not the only kind of bond it issues, but it is one of the types of bonds that's issued by the U.S. government. It's special in two ways. The first thing is, it's issued by the U.S. government, and the U.S. government is considered to be essentially default risk-free. Everybody knows the U.S. government is going to be around five years from now, and the U.S. government has always kept its promise in terms of the 
bond payments it promises when it issues bonds. So a TIPS is default risk free. It's also inflation protected. What that means is that the government says, we're going to guarantee the face value of $1,000, inflation adjusted. So if there is inflation over this period, the actual payment that's going to happen at the end of the five years, as well as during the period in terms of the coupons, is going to be adjusted by how much inflation there was, so that the real purchasing power of those payments will remain constant. So we've now eliminated the risk of inflation by having an inflation protected bond. So a TIPS eliminates the default risk and the inflation risk. And now suppose that this particular TIPS bond has a maturity of n equal to 2, so 2 years maturity. Suppose that its face value is equal to $1,000. And to make it really simple, suppose that it's a zero coupon bond. In other words, there are no coupon payments. So what would that look like? Well, if you hold that kind of bond, then you're going to wait two years to get the $1,000 inflation protected payment from the government. So now the question is, how much would you be willing to pay for that kind of bond? It has no coupon payments, it just has a final face value of $1,000 inflation protected, and because the government is issuing it, the federal US government is issuing it, it's considered to be default risk free. Well, as you think about how much you'd be willing to pay for that bond, you might think about what else could you do with your money? Where else could you invest it? Suppose that there was a savings account that was also risk-free. It was fully insured. So you're not going to lose the money in that savings account. And suppose that that savings account is inflation protected as well. So your balance every year will be adjusted by the rate of inflation. We now have another way of investing risk-free and inflation protected. And the question you might ask yourself is how much would you have to put into that savings account now in order to have a balance of $1,000 two years from now? So suppose that savings account pays an interest rate of R, where R is denominated in decimal form. So a 2% interest rate would be 0 0.02. If you put an amount X into that savings account today, then one year from now, you're going to still have that balance, plus you have collected interest on that balance. So what you have one year from now is 1 plus that interest rate denominated in decimal form times what you started with. If the interest rate is 2% and you put $100 into your savings account, then a year from now you're going to have $102. 1 plus 0 0.02 times the original $100. What about two years from now? Well, two years from now, you're going to start with that balance and carry it forward by another year. You'll still have that balance, but you'll also collect interest over that year on that balance. So we have to multiply that by 1 plus R one more time. So your balance at the end of the two years is going to be 1 plus R squared times X. If you kept it in for three years, it would be 1 plus R to the third times x. If you kept it in for four years, it'd be 1 plus r to the fourth, and so forth. So now we have an equation that says uh, the balance at the end of two years is going to be 1 plus r squared times x, and we're asking the question, what would x have to be if we wanted that balance to be $1,000 two years from now? We can now solve for x, and we'll get that x is equal to $1,000 divided by 1 plus r squared. So in order to have $1,000 in your inflation-protected, risk-free savings account two years from now, you have to put this amount 
into that savings account today. Now we can return back to the question of how much would you be willing to pay for this bond. That bond gives you $1,000 two years from now, just as a savings account that's inflation protected and risk-free would give you if you put in an amount X. So if that bond price is any higher than this, you wouldn't want to pay for that bond. You'd rather put your money into that savings account. If the price of that bond is any less than X, then nobody would use the savings account and everybody would just buy bonds. So the law of one price will say that the rate of return you get on the bond must be the same as the rate of return you get on a similar savings account with similar levels of risk. And that means that the price that you're going to be willing to pay for the bond is equal to the face value of the bond divided by 1 plus R, where R is the interest rate in the savings account, to the nth power, where if the maturity date is two years, that will be two. If it's three years, it'll be three, and so forth. So again, if the price is any higher than that, everybody would just put the money into the savings account, nobody would buy the bonds. If the price is any lower, nobody would use a savings account and everybody would simply buy bonds. So in equilibrium, it must be that this is the price and it's determined by the law of one price. We have two related markets and the rate of return will equalize across those two related markets. So now we've come up with a general formula for the price of a bond with a particular face value and the particular maturity rate, depending on what the interest rate in savings accounts of equivalent risk are. Now that formula is going to get a little bit more complicated if there are also coupon payments that happen in between. But the basic idea remains the same. The law of one price will determine what the price of bonds will be as we compare rates of return across similar markets.